Okay, thanks, Mary, um, and thanks to NCPTT for inviting me. It's, this is a real secret passion I, of mine. It's not so secret now, but um, I tend not to work on these things. But what I am going to talk to you about today is a really remarkable project. It actually is a perfect follow-up um, from Dylan's talk because in my wildest imagination, I had no idea what the follow-up would be in terms of public response to what was a very academic uh, pursuit at the time it started. I'm gonna bring you east. We're gonna talk about the 1964-65 World's Fair, um, a site of unbelievable significance to the baby boomers. And in the 10, this project began 15 years ago, and I have watched in that time the incredible groundswell of what has happened um, as a result of this uh, very early work that, that began in uh, 2005. Um, so yesterday and this morning, we heard a good deal about the power of narrative um, as a critical aspect of placemaking. I'm not going to talk about that. I'm a materials guy. I talk about materials. But you can't, narratives are hard to tell if you don't have stuff to link them to. Um, some cultures don't need it. We need it. And we've been, we've been needing it for probably over 10,000 years. Um, uh, place is also about physical stuff, as I said. The stuff we design, the stuff we use, and the stuff we walk away from, the stuff we leave behind. And I hope we realize that when we come to the question of what to do with Route 66. It's just as much about a story of what was left as what can be reused and, and repurposed and relived. Um, so uh, we call these historical palimpsests cultural landscapes. And um, while most of my research and teaching is about uh, how to address the materials and materiality of these places uh, and the tangible connections they provide to us for these narratives. Um, so um, I, I'm going to bring you back east. We're, we're still going to stay with road culture, but it's not specifically, it's not the real thing. It's a facsimile. It's a, it's a, it's a remarkable icon of the automobile, of, of Americans' love affair with the automobile. Before I get into that, though, let me just say a few things about um, um, the type of site I'm going to talk about. So since the late 1970s, almost every discussion on preservation of the recent past has raised the question of whether these works require a, a, a different set of principles or practices for their preservation. I mean, this has been debated now for over a decade, so I don't even know why I'm mentioning it. Um, and, but some of the things that have been cited have been too close in time to us to be objective, too much information to um, deny the fact that we can actually honor the original intent. In other words, we have so many documents, it wouldn't be a stretch to know exactly what was intended by the designer or the user. Um, and then the problem of the, uh, the use of new materials and new technologies, which didn't work. Um, this was, uh, I think Kaiser alluded to this before, uh, the fact that their ephemerality, whether intentional or not, makes them rather difficult to, to, to preserve. So as a category, world fairs are perfect for these kinds of problems. Um, um, they often, uh, fair buildings often pushed the aesthetic and technological fronts in an effort to forecast the future, and the 64 World's Fair was no different. Uh, most of them was designed to be temporary, and some remain by design and others by default. And what I'm going to talk about today survived by default, although um, it was the uh, creator of the fair, Robert Moses, who wanted to see the New York State Pavilion um, saved. So I'm going to talk about the New York State Pavilion designed by Philip Johnson. Uh, um, it gives us really a great opportunity to explore um, um, one of the first and certainly largest public pop art monuments, the great Texaco roadmap, that's the connection to our, our road uh, uh, subject today and yesterday and tomorrow. And one of the few remaining works is still in situ at the fairgrounds. Um, it was also one of the earliest monuments uh, to commemorate Americans' love affair with the automobile. Um, so I'm going to talk about a project that began, as I said, 15 years ago in um, 2005 with funding from the National Endowment from the Arts. Um, to take a look at this much beloved and nearly forgotten and quite uh, damaged um, icon of the 64 World's Fair. So, uh, how many went to the 64-65 World's Fair? Yeah. Um, 
I, um, I lived down the street. I grew up in Brooklyn, and uh, I was there every weekend. This is, I have to say, this was the first project in my 35 years I've ever worked on that I actually experienced it when it was new. That was very humbling uh, reality. Um, so for the first time, I had a, a memory of a place that was now being celebrated for its, um, its, 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 its preview as a, as a new work. Um, uh, so with money from the NEA, we had a chance to look at this, at this amazing place, and specifically the New York State Pavilion. Not much of the fair survives in terms of buildings. The 64-65 World's Fair was an event of unprecedented size and expectation. And it came to symbolize, as historians uh, in hindsight have realized, uh, the paradoxes of a decade characterized by the culmination of post-war prosperity and the beginning of America's cultural and political revolution, if you remember the late 60s. Um, one historian cited that it was really the last true World's Fair in the US, World's Fairs largely succumbing to digital, the digital world. We don't need to go to a place to see the rest of the world. Um, the fair celebrated commerce and consumption, as indicated by many corporate pavilions. In fact, it was the most commercial of World's Fairs. It had more corporate uh, buildings than it did international buildings. Um, so um, it really celebrated what America was doing best uh, at the time and still is. And it was the swan song of Robert Moses, who began his career 30 years earlier on the same location uh, at Flushing Meadows, Queens with the 1934 World's Fair. So they, it was a repeat site, two World's Fairs. And the intention always was to leave a park of unprecedented size for New York City's populace, now Queens populace, which, as you may know, is growing in leaps and bounds. It was also Governor Rockefeller's party, uh, because being in his state, um, he, of course, insisted that the pavilion be the largest, the biggest, the tallest of all the state pavilions uh, at the fair. And you see it here. Um, with the arrow, uh, if you don't recognize it um, in form. Uh, the pavilion was composed of three uh, components, the tent of tomorrow in the, in the lower uh, foreground there, uh, the theaterama uh, and the, sorry, th the tent in the upper um, middle, the theaterama in the lower left, and the three Astro View towers, uh, all designed by Philip Johnson and Richard Foster, and of course, the towers are quite memorable now because of their, they featured prominently in Men in Black, um, in fact, as flying saucers. The Theaterama uh, was designed to display American contemporary art, something that most of us don't realize today. Um, uh, it, uh, uh, Johnson was a great lover of pop art. Uh, this is the period when it was just being introduced into the, to, uh, to the public. And in fact, the Theaterama, uh, um, had uh, Andy Warhol's famous 13 Most Wanted, which was censored before the fair opened. They took them down. They whitewashed them, actually. Um, uh, with less than serious references to a circus tent and flying sa saucers, Johnson's pavilion embodied the same pop culture references found on the associated pop art that was showcased uh, in the pavilion. It was highly popular with critics. Vincent Scully called it the only work of architecture at the fair. And the public, uh, by the close of the fair, six million people had passed through its gates and walked on its famous map floor. So if anything was to survive at the fair, this was a good one because it really had cachet at the time. Um, Johnson's engaging design was greatly aided by engineer uh, Lev Zetlin's elliptical cable suspension roof, with, again, the largest of its type in the world at the time, the largest slip cast concrete columns at the time to support it. It was a, for Rockefeller, it was about being big. Um, stretching beneath the multicolored acrylic panels of the tent roof was the world's largest two-dimensional map, 23,000 square feet. Um, and as you'll see, um, or as you'll see in a minute, um, it took the form of one of the most well-known uh, popular uh, icons of the automobile age, a, a road map, in this case, the Texaco road map, who sponsored the floor. But Johnson was no uh, stranger to history. He knew the power of making a giant pavement that one could interact with. Um, it had been done centuries earlier, um, here seeing the, the, the Madaba map in Jordan, uh, which displayed in fragmented form now, the known Christian world from the sixth century. So this was something that had uh, humans have um, 
have, have loved this way of interacting geographically, spatially, through representations in floor pavements. So here it is in all its glory uh, in 64 and 65. So it was without question the Texaco uh, roadmap of the state of New York was the pavilion, pavilion's most popular feature. Uh, and possibly of the fair itself. I mean, I remember it. Uh, I don't think a weekend went by when I was at the fair that I didn't uh, find myself on it, uh, standing where my aunts and uncles lived, uh, uh, where my parents lived, uh, uh, the journeys we took by car um, uh, in the state. Um, it all could be reenacted and, 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 and lived on the map. Um, it was fabricated from Terrazzo as an exact copy of the Great American Road Map. The pavement celebrated one of the most iconic of pop American pop symbols, uh, again, while symbolizing the country's love affair with the automobile and the gasoline and the highways that uh, transported it. Uh, Rockefeller himself paid for it, uh, and at the time, it was the largest and most expensive terrazzo project ever undertaken, costing a million dollars um, in 64. Um, and as I said, the brilliance of the design was that the, was the way the public could physically interact with the map, standing where they were born, where they lived, or recreating a journey. Like most structures at the fair, the pavilion was not designed to be permanent. Nevertheless, at, at the closing of the fair, Moses insisted it remained due to its design elegance and the high cost of demolition. So uh, while the Theodorama was subsequently rehabilitated, the Tent of Tomorrow seen here uh, was eventually closed in 1976, and although despite its ruinous condition, it remains a beloved landmark uh, to many New Yorkers uh, today. And Johnson himself, near the end of his life, um, thought that it would make a fine ruin, and that's a quote. Okay, so I'm not here to talk about the pavilion, although it would make a marvelous topic. I really want to talk about the roadmap, the pavement, because that's really we're talking about um, um, roadside and road architecture and the infrastructure that are the highway created. Um, terrazzo uh, is a very interesting material. It's a composite material, ancient. It's poured in place or precast, used for walls and floors. Uh, traditionally, it was the uh, one of the earliest and ultimate recycled materials. Uh, originally uh, uh, composed of uh, chips of marble from the cutting of dimensional stone, and then used in in a new way as a composite for floors. Um, it comes from the Roman Opus Sininum, and it was revived by the Venetians in the 15th century. Uh, its introduce, introduction into the U.S. Uh, began late in the 19th century, popularized by Italian immigrants who came over with the craft and created many of the great uh, floors and pavements of both uh, commercial and, and, um, and, and government buildings. Um, it was durable, uh, versatile, uh, economical, and anyone who's been to an airport lately knows it's been revived um, as an artistic medium for the great uh, airport floors. And you see here an example from New Orleans, one of my favorites for an oyster bar, um, where the oysters have been portrayed in terrazzo uh, in the floor. Very briefly, um, I, I'll just go uh, into the, the composition and construction because it's critical when we talk about the production and, and uh, preservation of the, of the Texaco roadmap. So for over two years, we studied the materials and fabrication of terrazzo. We surveyed the condition of the, of the roadmap. Uh, we developed pilot treatments for the 567 four by four tiles. Um, just a little bit of background. There are two ways of making terrazzo. One is the bonded method, where it literally is bonded to the underlayment of the floor. And the second is the unbonded, where it floats on a sand bed. Fortunately, the, and because of the, uh, the quick turnaround for the, in the production of the fair buildings, the great road map uh, in the New York State Pavilion was made uh, in the unbonded way. And this would be critical for us later to develop a strategy for how to get at the tiles and eventually the, the proposal to have them repaired off-site. Um, this would be critical because if it had been uh, fixed in place, it would probably be very, very difficult. And here you just see uh, a replica we made on the left and on the right, a diagram from a period resource um, in the 1930s of Terrazzo uh, in the uh, floated method. Um, believe it or not, this is the only photo in the lower right we could find of the production of the floor uh, as it was being installed as tiles. 
the fellow who's in that photo I, I interviewed, he still works for the Mount Morris uh, Floor and Terrazzo Company in the Bronx, New York, and he remembered uh, placing the tiles and preparing it and was an amazing uh, source. He, in fact, made um, the model I showed you in the previous image. And here on the left, just again, some diagrams of how these, uh, how the New York State Pavilion tiles were made, uh, complicated uh, and somewhat uh, specialized uh, production, again, for the quick turnaround time uh, for, the, uh, for the floor. I'm not gonna go into this too much because I, I don't think this is really the audience. Um, but what we, what we did discover was that it was truly um, terrazzo for the modern age. Uh, it was probably the first um, uh, terrazzo to use plastic and glass uh, as the aggregate. Um, plastic inlays, of course, uh, uh, prior to this, I don't think there were any examples of trying to make a roadmap, so all those great uh, roadmap symbols had to be fabricated and plastic in red, blue, green, again, uh, hi highly faithful to, the, to map symbology. These had to be uh, invented. Uh, here you see thin section, um, Thin, thin sections of the uh, of the various uh, colors in the map, um, which show that um, they had different ratios of aggregate to paste. Uh, the colors that were used in the paste for the map colors, um, the, the glass and um, the marble that you can see was was used. The plastic inserts we studied; these were again highly uh, specialized. Uh, rigid plastic was used, uh, polymethyl methacrylate for the for certain uh, symbols and cellulose acetate uh, butyrate was used for the flexible parts that had to be bent. So all of this was a voyage of discovery for us because nothing like this had ever been studied. Um, but this was per perhaps the most um, evocative uh, aspect of the map, which is here we have a product that was an absolute symbol of modernity, um, and yet it had, in a few short decades, had come down to us as an ancient pavement. Um, and how to reconcile um, what we love to talk about, which is age value, um, and the necessity and, and demand of this icon to be and look modern. You know, how do we reconcile that? This was uh, the question also which it begs is, could it be walked on again um, if and when the uh, pavilion would be reopened um, for visitation and reuse? Um, <clears throat> to add insult to injury, um, the the great tent, uh, the, the acrylic panels had been removed. Um, the, um, uh, the, the floor had been turned into a roller skating rink in the 1970s, which didn't help things. And quickly, uh, with cracking and deformation, uh, vegetation moved in and created this quite evocative landscape. In fact, at the time, we, uh, something I'll talk about later, we, we, uh, we did, we did attempt some early uh, digital platforms, some, some media platforms when we did this. It was all new for me at the time, but very effective, and not realizing how um, devoted the baby boomers were to this site. It had been closed since the 70s, so when we opened it up, it was a lot of interest um, for one day. Um, but uh, we had a show at the Queens Museum at the time this project was going on. We brought the conservators into the exhibit and had them living exhibit be part of the living exhibit while they conserved several of the panels. Um, this evoked stories from people who came to visit, so it was a win-win on all levels. Um, um, but at the same time, uh, an artist in the next gallery um, took a totally different pass at this and really looked at the passage of time and the idea of weathering as uh, value added to the work. And this is, of course, a real flirtation with with danger for a conservator, but it was a very, very interesting juxtaposition to have side by side in the galleries. I loved it. It was completely uh, unorthodox. Um, so let's take a uh, closer look at this. Um, um, again, as I said, I mean, it looks virtually nothing like it did when it was new, shiny, polished. Uh, think of those airport floors. Um, vegetation, water, thermal stresses, they all cause serious loss, disaggregation, the tiles deformed, um, and of course there was the, the, spo the spolia, you know, what we know from ancient Rome, uh, probably baby boomers were coming back and stealing little pieces of it uh, for, their, for their memory uh, uh, china cabinets. And um, we had a lot of lost Texaco stars, uh, you know, the kind of stuff you'd go after. Um, and a lot, and uh, well, the condition looked atrocious when we started, but I'm going to show you through some really creative 
uh, ways of measuring loss, we realized that we were being uh, um, biasly influenced by an accumulative condition when in fact tile by tile, it really wasn't all that bad. Um, so here are just some details um, uh, of, the con of the conditions. So what we did, um, uh, I realize now in, 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 in hindsight, I probably should have gotten Google to fund this because we were really creating these, um, these um, uh, 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 geospatially referenced um, documentation plans or maps um, that um, in some way are very much like what we use today when we, when we use Google. Um, but in order to better understand the type, severity, and pattern of condition and decay, uh, we had to record the entire map and plan. And we used orthorectified photography to do that. Each of the 567 tiles was photographed and rated on a scale of 1 to 10 for condition. Remember, we had to give to the city of New York, who just wanted this project to go away. Um, uh, but you can't do that with an NEA grant. So we really had to come up with a shorthand way to give the site managers some idea of what the condition of this thing was and its integrity. So we had three broad conditions, good, fair, poor. They worked into a one to 10 scale. And what we discovered was 59% of the tiles were in good condition, 29 fair and 12% poor. This was all done in a GIS platform. Uh, um, so with that and with less than 10% tile loss, we felt that, that conservation was a reasonable option for this despite the naysayers who said it couldn't be done. It would also play in later to determining cost and time estimates and, um, you know, and, and convincing uh, the politicians that uh, it was worth uh, uh, saving this um, uh, in terms of time and money. Um, so uh, uh, what we did then was to um, identify a small section, and you'd appreciate the fact that how do you get at this, um, we decided to work uh, to select Long Island because it was a part jutting out um, as the pilot treatment program. And eventually about 10 tiles were lifted, brought it to the Queens Museum, and therein began the idea for a exhibition. Um, it began with devegetation. Um, this is what we called it for graduate students so they didn't complain that we were having them do slave labor. Um, and. Um, uh, all the objects and artifacts found, including pieces of the map itself, uh, we used a classic archaeological grid and we left them in place on the grid itself. It was a natural grid. Um, and we bagged these later for, for possible uh, reuse. Uh, we created this tetrapod, um, um, basically went to Home Depot, bought the supplies, created this rolling um, uh, scaffold with a camera mounted at a fixed focal length, and it gave us the ortho-rectified photos we needed. We didn't have to do rectification. It was perfect. Um, uh, and we moved it around, and in a very short time, we did all 500-plus tiles. Uh, we later used this for the world's oldest mosaic in Turkey. It would, actually, it's ironic that it got its birth in 64 World's Fair and then went to 8th, 8th century BC uh, in Turkey to record the pavement there. Um, and this is what we produced. It was actually the star of the show at Queen's Museum. It was enormous. I don't remember. It would have filled one of the walls here, uh, printed on mylar. And um, it was the first time one could see the map in all of its deteriorated glory. Um, and in a way, you never can see it when, you're, when it's on the floor. I mean, you just can't, can't comprehend it. Of course, the pavilion was designed for the map to be seen from mezzanines. And it's, again, Johnson's brilliance in the design accommodated for this. Then, uh, this thing was like a Tetris game. You couldn't move, you had to move panels out of the way to get at other panels, so it was, if you know the game. And so we had to create this special rake to pull that, you couldn't lift them, you had to pull them, drag them along the sand bed, and then eventually lift them out. Um, uh, and before we could uh, get them too far, we had to stabilize them temporarily. We used a f uh, classic uh, conservation techniques of, uh, of gauze and, uh, uh, a temporary adhesive facing. We used uh, uh, methyl cellulose for this uh, and, and bound the edges uh, um, as needed. And then you see on the lower right, <clears throat> we moved them into the Queen's Museum where we could then work on them. And again, I realized quickly we were part of the exhibition. We could do that. Um, uh, and uh, let me quickly, because I'm running out of time, let me, uh, let me just show you some, um, 
some of the processes then with the panels that we had to uh, uh, work on. Uh, here, is, um, here is a very da badly damaged part of Long Island. Um, here it's flipped over. The backing has been removed to lighten the weight and get at the, the design layer on the top. We had to remove the reinforcements, which were causing a lot of cracking. Um, here that's all being done in the museum. Um, you see the backs of the panels. Uh, uh, and then we began experimenting with different ways of backing the panel to make it lighter in weight. We ultimately decided on using a poly, uh, on, a, on a plastic um, uh, honeycomb panel, a polypropylene honeycomb panel, which would reduce the weight significantly. These, these things weighed uh, quite a bit. Um, um, and we wanted to, in the event that they would be moved around for exhibition to fundraise for the, for the map, we knew that we'd have to do it this way. Um, also, the idea of sending the real places, parts of the map, would really generate um, uh, supporters. So here are just some processes, again, uh, self-leveling uh, cementitious backing materials uh, proved to be really effective because these things were not easy to manipulate. Uh, just some examples. Um, and there's the honeycomb, which we eventually went to. It reduced the weight significantly. And here the conservators are on the museum doing that work. Uh, I want to get to, we did some testing because we were proposing some somewhat strange methods of backing that was not classic uh, mosaic conservation techniques and we wanted to make sure they were reversible. Here we ran some uh, flexural uh, tests uh, uh, and some freeze thaw tests to see the durability of these things because it was, from day one we said this has to stay in situ. The genus locus of the pavilion requires that it have the pavilion, uh, have the, uh, the map pavement in place. Here's some of those tests that we ran. Uh, and then here it is flipped over. And now the question is, how old should this look? You know, all the terrazzo manufacturers we talked to said, oh, you gotta grind it down again. You have to really uh, make it look new. And I wasn't convinced about that because I think, like the baby boomers themselves, you know, they're not the 12 year olds that they were when they went to see this thing. And I think it has tremendous power uh, to look its age as a modern work. Uh, um, and so uh, we had issues regarding the infill, the missing portions. Uh, the other thing was, so two requirements, look its age, um, which does not mean destroyed, and also it had to be legible. What is a map if it's not legible? So here we really uh, trespassed some, some, um, some major tenets in conservation, which is because this thing was actually made by Yale art students projecting a Texaco roadmap and then tracing it. Talk about the pre-digital age. Um, and so it literally was a complete uh, translation of the paper map. And of course, I, on eBay, I bought a 64 roadmap and we used, New York State map, we used that to make the inserts that we um, took from the CAD drawings um, and then hooked it up to a CNC machine and made the missing parts. It was a brilliant a way to use modern technology to, what, to address the losses in what was a handmade product. These things were all cut out by art students with little um, jigsaws. And here you see uh, uh, the panel that's, that's getting, you see the inserts. Uh, you can see these here, if I can come on a little bit here. here. These are being, these we've made and we have placed uh, uh, here they're being placed uh, in, the, in the panel, um, and then the, the fills are being put in, and here's a, on the left before and on the right and after. So um, this was all done to convince, uh, uh, again, everyone involved in the decision making that this was a project that could go forward. Um, uh, I don't remember the numbers now, but it was all quite doable uh, in terms of panel by panel. Uh, and uh, before, Oh, and so then, again, we really realized that this whole process needed to get out of the lab, um, out of the small circle of, of conservation, and into the greater public. So we got the Queens Museum to, to support this. We had an exhibition back on the map, um, and it was real, truly was re remarkable. On the lower left, you see a facsimile, a giant blown up uh, paper road map, um, um, uh, the way Johnson had conceived it, and then on the right, the actual real pieces. And again, to this point of authenticity, uh, we could have a whole conference on this, but there is, a, it's a slippery slope for sure. Um, but I think it is the thing that all the millennials are desperately seeking.
and but they don't really none of us really know what it means but we know when it's not right okay so almost done here um, oh so the, this is the this is the end so um, despite all this work uh, the city didn't really have the confidence the money uh, growing political support to do anything so the next best thing was to bury the map and I thought, oh, we're going to bury the map. It'll be out of sight, out of mind. But the reality was what we realized is when we announced, again, to your point, when we announced that the map was going to go um, uh, hidden, the groundswell was huge. So we opened up the site for one day, and thousands of people came to see the map for the last time before it was buried in classic conservation methods um, using reburial the way is done, as, as is done for, for example, Roman mosaics. Totally reversible, but it would put it out of the uh, hands of uh, thieves and vandals, and it would protect it until uh, time and political will could, uh, could, could preserve this thing. Um, I just took these off the website the other day. Um, you may, some of you may have seen the film that has been produced. It's quite remarkable on the, 60, on the 64 Wall Street, but particularly the pavilion. The map features in it. Um, and in the lower left, um, um, they are now, you can see on the lower right, the gravel that is covering the map. You see it, unbeknownst to me, they put our pilot treatments back on the site. Uh, they were formerly in the Queens Museum storage. And on the lower left, they have these opening day, they have these days several times a year, and people come, they touch the map. It's really like going to the Vatican um, and rubbing St. Peter's toe. I mean, they really, the baby boomers have made this their site. So we should make sure it's on your site, on your website. Um, but it, it has the whole project, the, the pavilion's gotten painted and the engineers are studying what to do with the pavilion. And it all started with a seemingly insignificant component of a much bigger project. But it was the one that had the human element. The map had the human element. To talk about the world's largest compression bicycle wheel roof, I mean, you have to be an engineer to care, right? So the engineers in the, in the audience. But this had visceral human um, Placemaking abilities, and um, I have to say, uh, uh, I will. Ne I have since this project. I have not done a project that doesn't have social media. It doesn't consider all the possibilities of getting the public involved in in um, in what you're doing. So, thank you very much. Uh, sorry if I went over time. I, it's not quite working. I questions. We have time for questions. Who would like to ask the first question? here <laughs> I, I attended what I think was the first day that it reopened it, there were it was like hours long I mean it was an unbelievable number of people I don't know what the final if you know what the final numbers of visitation it, on that day was I, but I, I don't I mean it, it, it's on the website um, uh, tens of thousands at the at, you know it was it was crazy um, what is the where is the whole pavilion and the map now like what's kind of the next set of stuff um, yeah, well, as I said, this was a, a little did we realize that this would be a catalyst for, I think in some ways, forcing um, the, the borough's hands in terms of uh, engaging the public uh, and other professionals with what to do with the pavilion. I mean, they really, in 2005, they just wanted it to go away. Uh, but they realize, I think, now that it's a great asset. And of course, in 15 years, when we started the project, it was the 40th anniversary. It was the 50th anniversary recently. So uh, things have picked up. Um, the National Trust, right? Where's Amy? Ran a, a campaign, a, a charrette of sorts, or a design competition. Uh, I taught a design studio uh, with two Italians who thought this was the greatest thing they'd ever tackled. And, you know, uh, one lives in Venice, one lives in Rome. You would think they had some other things to work on. But, but um, the student projects were brilliant, creative, a discotheque, uh, a, 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 um, a planetarium. I mean, they had pretty great stuff. But the requirement was the floor had to stay in place. Um, um, there was a proposal to move it to the World Trade Towers. Thank goodness that didn't happen um, early on. Um, but 
I think the I think the groundswell has created now a good solid support group, and I I think it's just a matter of time. It's a very expensive proposition. What I had proposed is take the pavement out. It could be done locally. Um, um, involve. Um, uh, you could have a whole youth, uh, er, you know, inner city youth program. Um, this is not too hard to do, and it could be done with guest conservators and and kids um, as a way of, of remembering and, and honoring the 64 uh, World's Fair. So, um, other questions? Yeah. No, you need, we need it for a recording. Thank you, that was very interesting. Um, was there any communication or in interaction with Texaco itself? Yes, we tried. Uh, they were not interested. Okay. <laughs> um, we tried. I mean, in the, in the exhibition, I now know more about the birth of the American Roadmap. It's actually quite interesting story. And it intersected really well with um, G GIS and Google Earth. And in hindsight, I realized I should have gone to Google Earth. No, Texaco had no, had no real interest in it. And from the, the sample project, what's, what was the timeline for this between the documentation, the lifting, preservation? It was a three-year project. Okay. And it, it got extended be to three years because of the exhibition. It was not initially conceived, but when we saw the response, we knew we had a, a natural venue right there at the Queen's Museum within you know, a, a stone's throw from the pavilion. So. That, that was a very good idea. And then we had a website. In fact, uh, well, it's on my screen. There's the, there's the, um, the, uh, the website um, for the, back on the map and all the information uh, that we do. We always post all this uh, on the projects on the ACL website. Any other questions? Thank you. Any other questions? If not, thank okay, you, Frank. Okay, thank you. Thanks. <laughs>